Good evening. <clears throat> I am Spencer Cody, and this is Eagle's Heart Regalia. Tonight I'm going to teach you a story, or tell you a story. When I was in seventh grade, way back then, 1977, in our junior high in Lawton, Oklahoma, we had a, a, a club in our high school, in our junior high, it was called the Indian Club. <clears throat> the Indian Club, Indian Club. And they would take us on trips, and they would take us on uh, outreaches or to see different things in the state. One year it was state fair time. And so they they took us to the Oklahoma State Fair. There were a number of us uh, young Indians and we had a free ticket in and, and we had to pay for our own lunch. We didn't have, I was poor, we didn't have any money, but I went. And I was walking around the state fair looking at the, the rides, which I couldn't afford to ride, looking at the food looking at the uh, fat people, the fat, the big guy, and the bearded woman, and all the other, uh, the other unfortunate sideshow people there. And but I was enjoying myself. I walked around, it was big, lots of nice music. It was a real, real joyous atmosphere. And I heard a drum. I heard a drum beating and I followed that drum. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was a man up on a stage. It was a big stage. It was covered with a big tarp. And I went up there and I heard this drum and I could see men sitting around a big drum and they were singing. And I walked up and I saw something that forever changed my life. It was a man, an Indian man. He had on a paint similar to mine. He was the most handsome man. He was about 50. He had the classic features of a Plains Indian. He was a Comanche man. His name was George Smith. That's what the government name, government called him until he changed his name back to his Comanche name, <clears throat> which was Buji Washitaker. And the drum started beating, and this man started dancing. He was bare-chested. He always danced bare-chested. That's why I danced bare-chested. And as he moved to the beat of the drum, his head was moving. And he, was, he was dancing, and I was mesmerized. This man was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen in my life. His features chiseled. His eyes, it looked like he was seeing thousands of miles away. He came by and he danced and he turned and he looked at me. He kept dancing and as he danced, he kept looking at me until his head turned. Ruji was a world champion dancer. And as he danced, I watched his head and his head, as he danced, his head moved like an eagle. He would stop, turn, look around, keep on dancing. His stop would turn, his head would turn. It was beautiful. In that moment, I realized I'm an Indian like that man. Years later, I began searching back, going back to my, to my people. I'd gone to this legalistic church church that said that you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't be Indian, you can't go to powwows, you can't dance. And at the age of about 20, I said, these people are wrong. These people are trying to get us to become like them. And so I set about going back. And I learned, I wanted to learn how to dance. So I sought that man out. He was known as a rainmaker in the 60s. Wichita Falls, they had a drought. 
and they send a delegation to see Wuji, and he and ask him to come and pray for rain. He did. He went. He danced. As he danced, a little cloud formed in the sky. He kept on dancing. It began to spread. Dark clouds rolled in. And as he danced, it began to rain. And people were afraid. And the church that I was growing up, they said, stay away from that man. He's a witch. He made it rain. And I went to that man. When you go to an elder to learn, there's protocol. I brought him some groceries. I brought him a gift of tobacco. That's what they do in the old days. I drove up to his house and I saw him sitting on his front porch. And he also was a painter. He was painting. And he was just as beautiful as he was when I saw him as a child. Yet his hair was gray, streaked. He turned and he looked at me. With sharp eyes. Eyes of an eagle. He watched me walk up to him and he stood up. Long hair was flowing down to his waist. He sized me up. He said, you're Spencer Cody's son. I said, yes, I am. He had, my father worked as a, uh, at the local Indian hospital. Little side note. My father was a World War II vet. He fought all the way from France to Germany. He fought all the way to Berlin itself. He returned home and uh, he got, he went to school, became an accountant. And he applied with jobs in Lawton, Oklahoma. And everywhere he went, he told me this later, everywhere he went, they would say, we're sorry, we're not hiring. And they would hire somebody else. So finally, the last person my dad went to to, to get a job as an accountant the man said, Mr. Cody, let me save you a lot of trouble. There's not one firm in this town, not one bank. It's going to hire an Indian. So my father took a job as a dishwasher, and that's what he did for the rest of his life. But he was a dishwasher, and he worked himself up to be a cook at the Indian Hospital. <clears throat> and it was known all around Oklahoma, southwest Oklahoma. If you needed a, a meal, if you were hitchhiking through, if you needed gas money or a meal, you could always go to Spencer Cody. He would feed you. He did. So people would come, Indians would come through hitchhiking, stop at the Indian hospital. My dad would make them a meal. Even though he made $1.25 an hour, he always managed to give people gas money or help. He and my mother both. So Uzi said, He's, your father is a good man. What should I do for you? Spencer. I said, Uzi. I would like to learn how to dance. And I know that you're a champion dancer. Would you teach me? He looked at me. He stared into my eyes. He stared in my soul. He was assessing me. And then he nodded. Sit down. He sat down. He began to talk about what it meant to dance. What it meant to him, an expression prayer, worship in the arena. And then I asked him, Muji, I said, uh, many years ago, you made it rain in Wichita Falls. He laughed. I said, yes, I did. I said, do you know a lot of uh, these Christian people said that you are, you're evil because you did that. How did you do that? I said, well, Spencer, I don't know how to make it rain. He said, well, what I did know is how to pray. He said, I went out there, which stuff falls, and they began singing, and I began praying, and asking for rain for these people. I needed rain. He said, I didn't know it was gonna rain, but God answered my prayer. I prayed to the Lord God for help, and it rained. I said, how did you become such a wonderful world champion dancer? He said, Spencer, <clears throat> those days I was poor there were no jobs sometimes they held these competition dances he says and I needed to feed my family so I'd go down to the woods right down there he pointed down to me 
down a little grove of woods by the creek. He said, I would go down there and I would pray but to God. My children will be hungry if I don't feed them. My wife will be hungry. Would you bless me? Help me. <clears throat> and he won. Five-time world champion. And here was this man sitting in front of me, humble, approachable, un unlike people that I'd gone to or unlike people who had imparted spiritual advice to me before. This man was humble. He didn't preach at me. He did not speak condescending to me because I was an Indian. He did not speak down to me. He spoke to me as his equal. He spoke to me as he would a, a grandson, instructing me. And we spoke about this for days, and I would go back and visit him, and develop a very good relationship. He would always, I would call him my grandfather, even though he was a Comanche man. He was my teacher, one of my elders that I learned from. I learned from Kiowas, Comanche, Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Lakotas. I humbled myself and I learned from the elders. He taught me a great many things about what it means to dance in the arena. Now you go in, it's a time of prayer. It's a time of worship. It's a time of thanksgiving. It's a time to be one with the Alki, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of all heaven and all of earth. At the end of my instruction, which it never really ended, he said, when you, I will take you into the arena. He said, but one thing I ask of you, Spencer, You'll do this for me. I'll be forever grateful to you. I said, anything, Lord Jesus. He said, <clears throat> my only son has passed away. And when I die, my bloodline will leave the earth forever. He said, my color is yellow. And then he, when a man has a color or a dancer has a color, it just, just it should not just come just because you think it's a nice color, but it should come from prayer, meditation, revelation. It should mean something to you. Every aspect of one's regalia, the color, the beadwork, the style, should have spiritual significance. It should have a meaning. As I said before, uh, earlier in one of our uh, sessions, I said, Indian regalia, you can't go down to Indians R Us in the mall and buy these things. Everybody who makes regalia, all the elders, at least that I know, we have a spiritual meaning behind everything that we make. The color, the style, the bead, the size of the bead, everything has relevance and has meaning to us. That's why it's so special. So he said, my color is yellow, Spencer. When I'm gone, will you wear a yellow stripe on your forehead when you dance. He said, that way, I live in your heart. Every day that you dance, you see that yellow stripe, you'll remember me in your heart, and I will not die. So to this day, I wear this yellow stripe in honor of my elder and my teacher. Now, my colors originally were black and, black and uh, gold. When I first started dancing, I had a friend. Her name was Cheryl Red Elk. Good friend. She found that I was dancing. She said, I have a gift for you. And uh, I went to see her. And she had made a belt belt for me to dance in. This is actually the belt. The beadwork. It's periwinkle blue. It was her color. The zigzags are a sign of the Comanche Nation, a sign of the snake people. Shell Red Elk had debilitating 
rheumatoid arthritis. Her hands are crippled. She beaded this belt for me. She beaded most of it. And then my wife and I and a friend, we beaded the rest of it on the loom. Every bead she picked up with that needle caused her pain. Every single bead she's thinking about me. And so in honor of my friend Cheryl Red Elk, I changed all of my colors to that color blue to honor her. Now, you see my color on my face is red. You see black. I'm a follower of Jesus. That many, many Christians, they condemn. They think bad of Indian people who practice our ways of life, our traditions, and our culture. Because I've said before, what people don't understand, they fear. And so, I get a lot of pushback from Christian people who think that what I do, trying to stay true to my culture and my heritage and my people, is in their opinion wrong. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I am not in the habit of telling white people how to live their lives. We are free people. Eagles cannot be chickens. We have a way of life that's good. Our dances are noble. They are prayerful. That man that I learned from, Muji, was one of the most godliest men I've ever met in my life. Why was that? Because he was like Jesus. He wasn't preachy. He didn't condemn you. His heart was good. His thoughts were good. He spoke to me as a friend. Jesus. I read his words every day. He's kind, forgiving, gentle. He speaks good words of peace and truth. And so even though I don't have anything against Christian people, I think that a true follower of Jesus is one who acts like Jesus. A man who forgives others. You see, I was speaking to one of my adopted sons this morning, Aaron Garrison, Alcor, a white boy. I took as one of our own. I told him this. I said, Aaron, I said, in these United States, so many people claim to be Christians. I said, but Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother who sinned against you, Daki, God will not forgive you. And so I measure a follower of Jesus by his life fruit? Is he kind? Is she kind? Are they forgiving? Are they giving? Do they visit the sick? Do they feed the hungry? Do they help the poor? What is the motivation behind what they say? I heard an old saying a long time ago, a man said, what motivates you? Why do you do the things that you do? And who do you do them for? I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. Going to prison. I was hiding out on Indian land from the law when I was 17. I had assaulted a city official. I was being hunted. And I was out by myself on Indian land with my aunt. 
I was out there a month. My dad would come and give me clothes and food. End of that month, I was sent to a tree. And I wasn't a Christian. I'm not in church my whole life. All I heard was angry sermons and people telling me what I could and could not do. Never heard anything about love. My mom and dad loved me, though. They never condemned me. They loved me. Never stopped loving me. Even though I had brought shame upon their home. So I sat out among these trees one day. And I was, uh... Thinking about my life. Thinking about going to prison. I said, I will not go to prison. I will die first. I intended to take my life. And I thought about my mom and my dad. How kind they were to other people. How generous they were. And I prayed to their God. I said, Jesus, if you hear me, I'm going to die. Help me. He did. In that moment, my pain, my fear went away. My panic, my anxiety left. It was replaced by peace. And I determined right then that I was going to go and make it right, turn myself in. My father had been in town. He took care of it for me. I was able to go home. I'm now almost 60 years old, and that happened when I was 17. I'm not a religious man in that sense. But I'm a spiritual man in the sense that every morning, my wife and I, Beck, we pray. We listen to the words of Jesus. Think about what he said. Even this morning, I was praying. I said, Dog, Yahweh, Jesus, Son of the living God. Dog, Yahweh. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. I believe you. So, this wasn't so much of a lesson as it was just me sharing my heart. I hope that you're able to glean something from that.